Good morning and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, Professor uh, Ali Anayat. Uh, he's, um, he's in the uh, uh, University of Gutenberg, Sweden, and currently he's in visiting the United States. Um, so uh, the research area of uh, Professor uh, Anayat is uh, models of uh, uh, piano arithmetic, models of ZFC, and the connection between the two and uh, other uh, fundamental issues uh, of uh, foundations of uh, mathematics. Uh, today, he's going to talk about uh, uh, flexible Turing machines, uh, Professor Anayat. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for uh, the organizers for uh, arranging these uh, um, very nice online talks. I was looking at the schedule of your talks and it looks very impressive. Um, also, I, I just was realizing this morning that uh, this is my first talk, even though it's an online talk, uh, that I'm giving in an Asian country uh, that is east of Iran. So I've never been, uh, I've never traveled east of Iran in Asia, uh, but at least this way I'm traveling to China, uh, which is a, it's a pleasure to be able to do that. Um, so uh, the, the topic of my talk is, uh, as you see, um, on the surface, it, it just looks like it's about computability, but it's about really the interaction between uh, models of arithmetic and uh, computability. And um, I want to mention basically how the talk on this topic got started. Uh, uh, it really started with a paper that Hugh Wooden wrote uh, that was published in 2011. Uh, you're looking right now at the first page of this uh, paper and the title of it, as you see, is a uh, very um, philosophical uh, potential subtlety concerning the distinction between determinism and non-determinism. And, um, and I will just read as the uh, abstract here, uh, the coding of information into time. Um, so it begins by saying that it's well known that the property of randomness for finite binary sequences based on information content is not decidable. And then there's a reference, uh, the famous book on this topic by Lee and uh, Vitani. Um, we produce a dramatic version of this, but it is not our goal to simply reproduce this undecidability result. Rather, our intention in this chapter, uh, this is a chapter of a book, uh, to illustrate a potential subtle aspect of the distinction between determinism and non-determinism. The subtlety is the possibility of coding arbitrary information into time in such a way that a specific deterministic process computes precisely that information as additional output. Um, I mentioned this is a chapter in a book. A book is a collection of articles. As you, um, you here see the reference for the, uh, for the, for the uh, so it's really a paper uh, appearing in the chapter. Um, and uh, it's basically, a, it's a mathematical paper, but uh, there is this philosophical uh, interpretation of the result, which I will not address uh, in this talk. I will only stick to uh, mathematics that is, uh, developing from basically this paper. Um, so sometime in 2017, uh, a paper of uh, mine and uh, Rasmus Blanc uh, appeared, which um, is titled Marginalia and a Theorem of Wooden. Um, this um, paper basically arose from um, conversations that I initially had with um, Albert Fisser and uh, um, Volodya Shavrukov in 2012 um, about Wooden's paper. And then uh, in Gothenburg, uh, Rasmus Blank was my graduate student. Um, and uh, we worked on this topic together and uh, managed to um, extend and fine tune um, Wooden's result. Um, and basically the, the paper that you see here is more or less the content of, of this talk. Uh, as you see, the paper was appeared already four years ago. I, I have not published in this field since then. Um, and so it is certainly possible that I, I, would, I would think I was more in, in, in uh, touch with all the details of this uh, a few years ago. But in the course of the preparation of this talk, um, it was really a, a kind of a fun project to be re-engaged with this topic and uh, to see um, how it connects to other work that has appeared since 2017, which I will refer to. So I will begin with uh, some preliminaries because um, the result of Wooden is a 
I would say, is a culmination of a number of uh, results uh, which are extensions of Gödel's incompleteness theorem. And I would like to be able to, uh, in a way, show where it stands in this hierarchy of results in the incompleteness uh, path. Um, so this page is just to make sure we're on the same uh, page in terms of uh, basic definitions. Um, so I'm defining Robinson arithmetic, um, this finite, famous finitely axiomatizable theory, um, which um, is very powerful despite its apparent weakness. Um, so um, the, the power of it comes from the representation theorem that was proved by Tarski, Mostovsky, and Robinson already back uh, in 1953. Um, I will be using um, just uh, M bar for numerals. Uh, so S of S of S uh, so many times would be basically the numeral for a given uh, number. Um, also, uh, please interrupt me in case uh, I say something which is not quite clear. Of course, we will have time for discussion after my talk, but uh, I'm more than glad to also take questions uh, as the talk goes on. I, I might not be able to see things if you end up uh, writing a chat note, uh, in which case, I would very much appreciate uh, uh, Professor Yang to maybe bring my attention to any question that might be on chat. Okay, so the representation theorem is basically um, a theorem that I, I imagine everybody in this audience has seen before. This is just to make sure that we're, we're seeing it just uh, in terms of this minimal hypothesis that if you have a theory that includes um, Robinson arithmetic, then every partial recursive function can be represented uh, in, in this theory. And representability, of course, is in the sense that uh, is in the bottom of the page. Um, now, using the representation theorem makes uh, the task of uh, proving other results much easier um, because uh, basically as soon as you cook up a recursive function, then using this theorem, you know that there's a formula which answers to that recursive function in your theory uh, that simulates that recursive function. Uh, in particular, the, the diagonal lemma, the famous diagonal lemma, of Gödel. Um, Gödel, of course, only needed it for the provability predicate. Um, and then Carnap realized that it actually works for all formulas um, just a few years later, uh, 1934. And then Montague, uh, about 30 years later, uh, extended it uh, to uh, us to include a parameter. So this is the parametric version that you see here, uh, that, uh, that if you uh, have any binary formula, theta of x, y, there's a union formula with this property that, that gives you a uniform fixed point basically for all the instances of theta. Um, in some applications, this is uh, this parametric form is actually uh, the one to, that one needs. Uh, but in, in all the, I would say, basic applications, uh, for example, the first incompleteness theorem, um, you just, you just uh, can use the ordinary version which with only one variable with no parameter. So this is, um, in a way, the beginning of the story that ends up in Wooden's theorem, in a way, uh, the beginning of the story is Gödel's theorem, um, that, that given a sufficiently strong, consistent, recursively enumerable theory, so I use RE for recursively enumerable, or otherwise known as computably enumerable, uh, there's a sentence which is in neither provable nor disprovable. So as you all of you know, uh, this, this was proved in this form by Rosser. Um, Gödel had a slightly weaker form of this. And, um, and the proof with modern standards is, is really just uh, cooking up a formula to, a, uh, as you see, it's just a unary formula as opposed to a binary formula. Um, the, the famous Russell formula, which basically says, uh, uh, it says of that the sentence that basically is a fixed point of this formula says, if I'm provable, then my negation is provable earlier. Um, but let's actually look at the form of this because I'll be using this notation off and on um, this says for every pi, so pi is here ranging over proofs. Uh, if, and then if I put this pi under the turnstile, I mean that pi is a proof uh, using the axioms in T of, of sigma. Um, so in this formation, uh, for every proof of sigma, uh, such as pi, there is a proof which is smaller. And here by smaller, because we are coding proofs by numbers, so really we're saying that the code of the proof uh, is smaller. But again, I will not be distinguishing between uh, the code and the object given the fact that this is uh, basically um, 
how in, 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 in computability theory and also in, in, in models of arithmetic, uh, we don't keep talking about codes, uh, but ultimately everything is a code. Everything is a number, but uh, the things we're referring to might be set theoretic objects or syntactic objects. So. Um, okay, and then we have a slightly lesser known theorem, uh, an extension of uh, the Gödel Rosser theorem due to Mostovsky, um, as you see, some uh, 30 years after Rosser's theorem. Um, and this is the um, about the existence of um, formulas, unary formulas that are independent. Uh, so let me go back to the previous slide. Here, it was basically phi and its negation which were independent. Uh, whereas in this formation, you come up with a single formula, a single sigma one formula, such that um, if you plug in for x, let's say zero or one or two, et cetera, and thereby getting actual sentences, these sentences are all independent of each other in the sense that um, if you denote phi super zero as phi and phi super one as negation of phi, and if you take any function from the natural numbers to zero one, and you don't decorate um, phi of n with either zero or one. So either take phi of n or its negation. So for example, you might take phi of zero and then phi of one and then the negation of phi of two and then basically make some choices. You can make choices for each natural number n to whether to keep phi or its negation. Then uh, this infinite collection, when you add it to t is still consistent. Uh, so this is a much harder theorem to prove. And um, my, my purpose here it's just to point out that this too can be proved by, uh, by uh, a uh, application with, of the diagonal lemma, but it's, it's trickier. This particular one that I put here, I, I think it, it goes back to um, not Mostovsky, but um, to um, Harvey Friedman at some point had a proof very similar to this one, um, where you, where you uh, basically pick a formula rho of x, y, z, and u, which represents the recursive relation R, K, I, gamma, and pi. So K and I are uh, uh, numbers. Um, gamma is the code for a uh, formula, and uh, pi is a code of a proof. And this stands for the recursive relation, which says there's a binary sequence such as S of K is I, and pi is a T proof of the negation of this sentence. So when I say T proof here, and also later in the talk, I mean a proof uh, whose axioms are coming from T, basically. So T is on the left-hand side of the turnstile. And then if you use the diagonal lemma um, um, and uh, you, uh, you, you can come up with a formula phi of X, which is T provably equivalent to, to this formula using the, uh, the parametric form of, uh, of um, the uh, diagonal lemma. And, uh, and then by just basically going through the steps, one sees that this, this does work actually. But the main reason I wanted to put this theorem is not the proof, but, but the fact that this, this, is, this, is theorem, this theorem is going to be generalized by uh, work we're gonna be doing today. Uh, actually, the next result um, that I'll be looking at is Kripke, which Kripke's theorem generalizes Mostovsky's. And then Woodin, in some sense, uh, generalizes Kripke, but not completely. So we're going to be talking about that later. Uh, um, for purposes of, um, I would say, exposition and also intuition, uh, it helps to be thinking of sigma one formulas as uh, basically um, codes for Turing machines. So uh, here I, would, I want to go through some, some basic assumptions and conventions that I'll be using throughout the talk. Um, so first of all, the Turing machines that I'll be looking at um, have um, the way they're designed, they have just an output tape and there's no input tape. So they, so they simply generate uh, an output. Um, and of course, the program of a Turing machine can be coded by, by a single number, uh, which E, this E is going to occur a lot, is going to be a typical code of a, uh, of a program of a Turing machine. And um, if your Turing machine is this uh, output only, Turing machine, then I'll write W sub E for the output of the Turing machine whose program is uh, coded by E. So this W E we're gonna be seeing a lot of. Now, given a Turing machine with program E, um, one can easily write down a formula, a sigma one formula in the language of arithmetic, which I'll call phi sub E with one free variable. 
such that uh, basically i is in w sub e if and only if in the standard model of arithmetic, um, if you stick in i as a numeral in p sub e, then uh, p sub e of i holds if and only if i is in w e. So uh, this is basically the, uh, um, the back and forth between sigma one formulas, the solutions of sigma one formulas and outputs of Turing machines. And of course, conversely, if you give me a sigma one formula, I can write a Turing machine uh, whose program can be easily calculated from the formula, that uh, the sigma one formula, again, with the same property that I is in W sub E sub phi, if and only if n satisfies uh, formula phi when uh, I is put as, as um, replacing the X, well, the numeral for I. Um, now, generally speaking, um, universal Turing machines correspond to sigma one formulas that provide truth definitions for sigma one formula. So that's two ways of saying the same thing: universal Turing machine or a, uni or a truth definition for a sigma one formula. So now um, we're looking at a, a theorem of Kripke, which was proved at about the same time that um, Mostovsky's theorem was proved. Um, I have here put. Um, both the sigma one formula version and the Turing machine version, um, especially because uh, Kripke himself puts the, uh, in his paper and also most expositions of Kripke's theorem just put the sigma one formula version. But it's good to see the Turing machine version because we're gonna be comparing this with Wooden's formulation and Wooden's formulation in terms of Turing machines. So um, Kripke's theorem um, says that if you bring me um, any consistent recursively enumerable theory T which is sufficiently strong, contains Q, uh, Robinson's Q. There is a unary sigma one formula, phi of X, such that if you fix any K, so pick any K, for example, um, pick um, 2021, uh, then the theory T plus 2021 is the only solution of phi of X is consistent. So this phi of X can be consistently any specified number that, that you want. In the Turing machine version, um, it's, it's kind of easier to kind of state it. Uh, for every sufficiently strong RE theory T, there is a program for a Turing machine such that if you specify any natural number, then uh, the theory T plus the statement that W sub E is only singleton K is consistent. So the only output of this Turing machine is the K that was specified at the beginning. So. Um, and uh, the proof outline, um, the, the wonderful thing, and also it's both wonderful and also frustrating about uh, many of these arguments involving the, 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 um, um, this topic. Uh, uh, the, the cleverness and the ingenuity is usually involved in coming up with the right formula for which one applies the fixed point lemma meaning once you actually find the right formula that works, then the proof tends to be fairly short. So in this particular case, uh, here's the, the formula that one needs to work with to be able to, to come up with a, a proof of Kripke's theorem. You first um, think of the, the recursive function defined on the girdle numbers of unary formulas. Let's, let's see what does this uh, recursive function do. Um, it takes a unary formula in the language of arithmetic, let's call that um, psi of x, um, and we say that f of the girdle number for psi of x is k, if and only if there is a t proof pi of the negation of k being the solution, the only solution to psi. And moreover, meaning this is not it, this is the first part, and there is for each shorter proof and each smaller, so each shorter proof pi prime and each, each smaller k prime, um, pi prime is not a t proof of, of this statement. So, so this is basically saying that there's a minimalization going on. You're looking for the first, uh, for the first instance where there's a pi and a k, which makes this possible. Um, and then um, you um, then, by the representation theorem, we know there's a theta of x, y, uh, which represents this recursive function. Um, 
And the desired sigma one formula is obtained by applying the diagonal lemma to theta of xy. So again, it, to actually see that this does the job, one has to sit down and work through um, the steps of the proof. But this pretty much is the, you know, um, the, the heart of it. You know, once you have this, it's a matter of just basically some bookkeeping to make sure that this works. Uh, so um, with, with Kripke's theorem uh, at our disposal, um, let's see. Um, now I want to say something about how this theorem connects to Mostovsky's theorem and also to Kolmogorov complexity and Shatin's theorem, just that because at the, as you recall at the beginning of, of, of my talk here, when we reviewed the first page of Wooden's paper, he, he referred to uh, undecide, undecidability of randomness. And basically he's referring this case to, to Chaitin's theorem. And I just wanted to point out here that uh, the connection uh, with Kripke's theorem. Um, so um, the, the first observation is that Kripke's theorem uh, is in a way stronger than Mostovsky's theorem because it implies it. Um, and the idea is that uh, if you fix a um, Kripke's Turing machine, then you could modify the output as follows. Uh, after an input K is produced, remember the input, uh, the output rather, uh, there is no input. The output is always going to be either empty or a singleton. So if the Turing machine produces K, then you, you compute its base two representation. Um, and then you output the collection of positions I such that the I digit of K is one. So this is pretty much Ackerman coding. You look at the, uh, you look at the finite set coded via the Ackerman method of coding by this output. Um, and the sigma one formula corresponding to this modified Turing machine, thanks to the compactness theorem, is easily, you can easily check that it's a T-independent formula. So it's a sm slight modification of the output of Kripke's uh, Turing machine ends up giving you uh, Moskovsky's uh, independent formula. Um, and then, um, here, I'm just very quickly just making a reference to Kolmogorov complexity uh, in passing um, in connection with this theorem of Kripke. Um, so uh, Kolmogorov complexity, uh, there are various definitions for Kolmogorov complexity. Um, they're variants of each other, but the one I, I'm taking here uh, is, is the easiest one to, to connect with uh, Kripke's theorem. Uh, is the minimal length of a program without output that inputs S and terminates. Uh, this definition depends on the programming language and one should choose one that makes complexity minimal up to an 001 additive term. So this is kind of just a uh, technical issue here about uh, using optimal, some optimal uh, machine. Uh, now Shayton's theorem basically says there's a premium about for every, for every theory about how much randomness it can prove. Uh, given insufficiently strong RE theory T, there is a fixed natural number associated with the theory T such that no statement of the form C of S is more than uh, N is provable in T for N larger than C of T. So, so for any uh, theory T, um, statements of this form can only be proved for finitely many um, values of N. So, so most instances that are true are gonna be unprovable. Um, and it's well known among people who uh, basically work with this topic that uh, Kripke's theorem, or some, pe some people actually don't necessarily refer to Kripke's theorem. They refer to a construction which basically Kripke very, Kripke's theorem easily gives you, uh, uh, implies Shatin's theorem. Um, there's a paper by, um, let's see, by Shen, S-H-E-N, and Bian Venu, and I think one or two other authors that uh, explores this topic. So I, I, I in case anybody is interested, I, I'm happy to provide a reference. Um, okay, at this point, we're ready to look at uh, to look at Wooden's theorem. Um, so the original formulation of Wooden's theorem was in terms of uh, sequences. I'll be looking at a set formulation. So uh, here, I just want to make sure that the formulation in Wooden's paper is understood, and then we uh, will be working with the set formulation, which is probably equivalent. So um, in Wooden's paper, um, the Turing machines um, begin their computation on a blank tape. Uh, at each stage, uh, they either produce no output, uh, in which case we write this notation, uh, E is the program of the Turing machine, um, and M is the stage. Uh, or the output of stage M is a finite binary sequence uh, T, uh, vector T, of length at least one. 
So if we write down output of t, output of uh, at stage m is t, we mean t has at basically is uh, uh, there's at least one symbol in it, uh, length at least one. And um, also the programs are of a nature that when you uh, increase this m, uh, when you go to the next stage, um, um, the the outputs are uh, basically get end extended. Each uh, each output is the either basically if you go to the next stage, either the output is the same or it's an end extension of the previous one. Um, it's a longer sequence uh, by uh, by uh, finitely many, of course, terms. Um, and also, the machines are so that at some stage uh, m zero. Uh, this, they basically uh, give you the same uh, output. So eventually, so they keep, they might of course not produce anything, but if they end up producing anything, at some point it would be uh, um, a finite sequence of uh, a binary sequence. Okay, in this context, um, we write down, notice in this notation, M was written for the stage. If you, if you delete now M, and we just write down output of E is empty, we just mean that output super M is empty for every M. And the same thing for um, if we have output equal to T, it means eventually your output is going to be T because we know these machines uh, eventually uh, halt and yield a finite sequence. Um, and uh, let's see, uh, I also use this notation, um, this square version of, of subset relation for being a proper initial segment. For a finite binary string S of length at least one, we say the output sub E is a proper initial segment of S. Uh, if either the output is T and T is a proper initial segment of S, or the output of E is just empty. Okay, with this in mind, uh, this is now the, the formulation um, of um, Wooden's theorem from his paper. Um, fix any RE. Uh, theory, uh, this LA is a language of arithmetic. So fix any RE theory um, extending PA in the language of arithmetic. So you could, you could take PA if you want or anything that extends PA as long as it's RE. Uh, there is an index uh, E sub SEQ. Uh, I've put SEQ here to emphasize that this is for the sequence version uh, that depends on T such that the following three conditions are satisfied. The first condition is that T can prove that if the output is not empty, then um, what I was just saying in the previous slide is provable. There's a stage at which um, you, um, you, you only output T basically and, and nothing more. Um, also, t provably in T, the consistency of T is equivalent to the output of, the of this machine being empty, nothing being output. And now comes the, the magical part. This magical part is, uh, is if you fix a countable model of T and you, um, and that's the model M, and you take a finite binary sequence S that is, I've written here M finite. M finite means this uh, is a sequence, it's a binary sequence that in the sense of M is a binary sequence that is finite. So remember, we're looking at a model of arithmetic. Models of arithmetic internally can do set theory. So from the point of view of this model of arithmetic, if it looks at a, a particular S, S is a natural number that codes a finite binary sequence. Um, that's, that's the idea. Um, but it's good to think about models of T as not just models of arithmetic, but think of it as models of finite set theory. Basically, you have a model of finite set theory that in which you can do all kinds of set theoretical constructions and arguments uh, uh, involving finite objects. So, uh, so if you take any finite sequence in the sense of the model S with the property that it, when M is done with this calculation of the output, the output is a initial segment of S. Remember this symbol was for initial segment. Then you can end extend M to another model N and satisfies T that was fixed at the beginning and now the output is precisely what was specified uh, at the beginning S. So this is exactly, this, this that you're looking at here is exactly um, the mathematical formulation of the sentence in Wooden's abstract that I read at the beginning of the talk. Um, the, the idea that, um, that, that any specified 
internally finite sequence S extending the output can be realized to be the output in a, in a longer universe. Uh, so, so when Woodin refers to index, uh, extending time, he means uh, end extending a model of arithmetic. And uh, he also argues that it's important that both models are models of T. Um, basically, you begin with a model of T. Notice M is a model of T. And also N is a model of T. So, so the laws of the universe, so to speak, the laws that we specified for the universe have remained the same. As we transition from M to N, the same laws of, uh, in this case, uh, some theory of, um, of um, arithmetic or finite objects is exactly the same. I'm, I'm specifying this theory being the same because it, there's a version of, um, of this theorem you, you, which uses uh, Kripke's construction, which uh, the, the model M here has to satisfy con T to be able to uh, get something close to this one. And I'll, I'll get to that a bit later. The set formulation is a little easier to, uh, to play with and, and also to, uh, to, 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 to read and understand. Um, so uh, given any theory extending piano arithmetic, there is an index uh, E subset. Uh, I'll be using omega um, in the talk uh, interchangeably with uh, Blackboard uh, font for, for natural numbers. So, um, so sometimes uh, I write omega, sometimes I write n. Usually I write n in, uh, for the standard model of arithmetic though. So there's an index where again, T can prove that uh, W sub E is finite. Uh, the output of the Turing machine with this index is finite. Again, con of T, if and only if um, W sub E is empty, provably in T. And now the, the third condition um, is, is a little easier to read. If you pick a countable model of T and some M finite set now, as opposed to a sequence, then M satisfies S is a superset of W sub E. In the, in the model, if you specify that S to be any subset that is just containing W sub E, then you can end extend M to, an N, to a model N where W sub E now becomes exactly equal to S. Um, the equivalence of the set formulation and the um, sequence formulation is, um, is proved in my paper with, uh, with Rasmus. Uh, it's a little trickier than one th would think at first, you know, because of the, uh, with, you know, there's all kinds of very elementary coding machinery between sets and sequences, but, but it turns out um, you have to be a little careful um, to be able to see that these are equivalent. But anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's just a remark in the paper, uh, the outline of the proof that these are the same equivalent theorems. Okay. Um, now, what, what we did uh, in the paper with Rasmus Blank um, um, is to extend or refine, um, you'll be seeing a lot of this word refined, um, um, which uh, of course one can call it also extension, but I, I prefer the refine because you're actually making the theorems more delicate and, 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 uh, and of course end up extending the theorem. So, uh, one refinement is that for the version that you saw in the previous slide, I sigma one is enough. That's, that's the first uh, improvement, uh, that you don't need the whole piano arithmetic. Um, so, the, so this is one, two, three, basically, that you see here, countable model of T. Everything here is the same as the previous slide, except that I sigma one, here, let's just look at it again. Here's PA with one, two, three, an accountable model. And um, here's um, theorem A plus. Uh, which is um, the version that we're looking at. Now, if your theory actually includes PA, then in condition three, countability can be deleted and you actually have it for all models. So th the two improvements therefore in the paper to Wooden's theorem is one, to reduce to I sigma one, the case of countable models and for the case of models of PA, which was actually the topic of Wooden's theorem to, to lift the countability condition. Um, so I would like to now um, go through some of the machinery used for the theorem, um, for theorem A plus, this refined version of Wooden's theorem. Um, one is Mostovsky's reflection theorem. So Mostovsky's reflection theorem um, 
says if you specify a fixed natural number um, and uh, pick a finite extension, a language extending uh, language arithmetic. Uh, so the usual formulation, by the way, is just for language arithmetic, but, but it turns out it's convenient to actually allow the language to have an extra constant symbol or some relation symbol sometimes. But in our case, we only need a constant symbol. But for the theorem to work in the same proof that Mostovsky gave, uh, L could be a finite extension of the language of arithmetic. Uh, then PA of L proves this Kant statement. Now, what is PA of L? PA of L is piano arithmetic extended to the language of L. So if the axioms of PA of L are the axioms of PA plus O instances of induction where formulas from the language of L are allowed to appear in the, uh, in the induction scheme. So you're extending your induction to allow, uh, for example, some constant symbols or some relation or no function symbols. That's exactly what P of, P of A of L is. What is this statement? This is the Kahn statement, consistency of a particular theory. This is the consistency of the sigma n theory of the universe. You see, in, in models of arithmetic for any specified n, there are partial truth definitions. So, so you can refer in a model of PA to the collection of all sigma n true sentences, as long as n is fixed. By, by Tarski's undefinability of truth, we cannot just look for, we cannot define the collection of all true sentences. But if we specify an upper bound on the complexity of the sentences, there are such truth definitions. So this, this is the collection of all true sentences in the language of, of, uh, of L. Uh, which is a definable subset of the background model of PA. And, and uh, Mostovsky's theorem says that uh, we have consistency. So in a way, this is a nice counterpart to Gödel's theorem, uh, Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. Uh, we cannot prove the consistency of the whole theory, but we can prove the consistency of big chunks, big fragments of, 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 uh, of the true sentences. Um, then uh, the next ingredient, which uh, at some point there's a reference to this, what's known as the small reflection theorem. Um, the small reflection theorem also works with the theory that's an RE extension of, in this case, I sigma one. Um, if you fix a sentence in the language of arithmetic, also fix a particular natural number N. Um, and you, if you consider this predicate, uh, this predicate is a formula in two, two free variables, P of X, Y. It stands for this is, gives you more information about what this formula is. It's, it's proof from these axioms, x comma y. Think of x as a proof, y as a sentence. This last formulation makes it easier to see what's going on. Basically, this x should be a proof from these axioms, t plus the true sigma n sentences of this formula y. So p of x, y holds typically if x is a proof of a particular sentence. And the proof should be a proof satisfying this property. So this X, if you remember, means that um, sometimes people put X down here for the length of the proof. We're here putting actually the proof down for the, super, uh, for the subscript. So if we take P of X, Y to be uh, this predicate, then in I sigma one, uh, we can prove the following sequence of sentences. If you, if you pick a, your favorite uh, P, which is the code of a proof, uh, if T proves implications of this form, that, that if the P that you picked is actually a proof of theta from the true sigma n sentences plus T, uh, then theta. So uh, that's, that, this, this small reflection theorem is kind of lesser known uh, than, for example, uh, Mostovsky's reflection theorem. But the, the proof is pretty straightforward, by the way. You have to just sit down and do some, um, some, some checking, uh, there's no, no surprise here. Um, and uh, the, the next two ingredients that you see on the page are the formalized second recursion theorem um, in computability theory. Um, and the version that we needed, um, we need some, the, proof, the formalized part here, that for every total recursive function, uh, from natural numbers to natural numbers, there's an index E uh, such that provably in this rather weak theory, I tell the zero plus X, uh, basically E is, is a fixed point uh, 
in the sense that W sub E is equal to W sub F of E. So this uh, is also known as Kleene's recursion theorem, uh, which has many, many applications in, uh, in computability theory. Um, one proof, by the way, of this, uh, I mean, you could look at a proof from scratch or you could actually prove it using the fixed point uh, lemma. Uh, in, in our paper, uh, we, we, give it, we derive this from, from the fixed point lemma. Um, and then uh, I think this is the last ingredient. Oh, no, I'm sorry, this is actually, uh, there's another slide for other ingredients for the machinery. So this ingredient here is also a fantastic ingredient. Uh, the refined arithmetized completeness. So arithmetized completeness refers to generally the fact that in piano arithmetic, you can prove completeness theorem for first order logic in the sense that um, um, you could prove that uh, a sentence phi is consistent if and only if it has a model. Uh, the models that you produce are basically obtained by arithmetizing um, the Henkin proof, for example, of the completeness theorem. And the models that you get in that way are, are typically done by uh, if you just open up like to, to a, the basic proofs, uh, you just simply formalize Koenig's lemma in, in arithmetic and, and get uh, such models. It turns out though uh, that there are, there's a whole uh, number of papers devoted to this topic that you could actually uh, get this theorem to work in smaller fragments. Uh, for example, I sigma one, there's also even a version of this which works for uh, I delta zero plus uh, X plus B sigma one that uh, Lawrence and I uh, worked on a paper on. But this version that I'm putting here is for, for I sigma one. Um, that if you fix a model of I sigma one, and if you pick a consistent theory extending Q uh, that is coded in the standard system of M. So every, um, um, this model of M, of course, if it's a model, if it's, a, it's the standard model, then, then, uh, then we don't have to worry about this. So, so typically our model would be non-standard. If the model is a, a standard model, we can just use the ordinary uh, completeness theorem. This is model of PA. Um, um, the, the idea about here, about being in the standard system means that um, there is a, if M is a non-standard model, there is an object in the model such that um, if you look at um, the standard elements of it, uh, then it's exactly the girdle numbers of, uh, of, of the sentences in T. Then there is a, recursively saturated end extension N of T. Um, so uh, the, uh, the idea is that you could build an end extension of M, which is a model of T. And it's also for some applications, it's really helpful to have this extra information that what you produce is recursively saturated. Um, so um, the, there is no restriction on the cardinality of M here. Um, if M was just countable one can use a Harrington's theorem that every model of uh, uh, I sigma one that is countable expands to W K of zero. Um, or one can use a refined version of Harrington's theorem due to Hayek, uh, which shows that every model of uh, I sigma one has such an expansion. Um, okay. There is a very nice- uh, Oh, please. Sorry, sorry, sorry for the in in uh, interruption. Uh, there's yes, a question course. from, from uh, Cheng Yong. Uh, oh, very good. He, he asked, what does it mean that T is coded in standard system of M? Uh, I think okay, yes. Uh, uh, yes. Repeat your, your explanation. Yeah. Yes, I will, I will be glad to repeat the explanation. Um, so since M is a model of arithmetic, um, M uh, basically has coding ability. So if you pick a, a, any member uh, M in, in capital M, some, some, some element of M, uh, you could talk about, um, you, you can think of that element as a long zero one sequence using Ackerman coding. Um, so the idea is that the, the best way to, to imagine really what the standard system is, is, is imagine that every member of M, instead of just being some, some element of the model, uh, it's actually some zero one sequence of finite or infinite length. Infinite because the model is non-standard. So it's gonna have, of course, um, finite in the sense of the model, but externally some zero one sequence that is long. So maybe I guess because I'm also, you might be able to see my, uh, my, my picture, uh, my video. So imagine having a long zero one sequence coded in, um, in the model. Now, the standard part of this long sequence would be this, the, the, the first omega members of it. So basically, 
the sequence is a long zero one sequence of non-standard length. And I could look at an initial segment of it, which would be the first omega members of this long zero sequence. So this omega uh, many members basically give you a long zero one sequence of length omega. Now that's the same as a subset of natural numbers. So when we, so basically we say a subset of natural numbers is in the standard system, if and only if an elongation of it is coded in the model. So, uh, so that's the intuitive definition of to be in the standard system. And um, uh, it's, it's basically one of the um, important invariants of models of arithmetic. Um, when we look at a model of arithmetic, beside this theory and whether it's uh, and, and other properties that we look at, one of the first things we ask about a model of arithmetic is what's the standard system of it? What are the collection of subsets of natural numbers that are coded in it? I hope this little tiny explanation was helpful. Maybe in the discussion section, I can give more information. Um, okay. Um, now here is um, a theorem of Guaspari. Um, so we're looking at, um, as you see, again, the machineries uh, involved in the, in the proof. Uh, what, I'm, what I mean by the machinery is the machinery, not necessarily of Wooden's original theorem, but this refined version uh, in the paper with, uh, with Cosmos Black. So Gosperi has a paper from 1979, um, which has a number of results, including this very, very nice characterization of pi one conservativity um, of, uh, for arithmetic. Um, if you pick an RE theory, a recursively enumerable theory uh, that is formulated in a countable language L that contains the language of arithmetic. And moreover, T extends PA of L. Remember we saw this uh, P of L is the extension of PN arithmetic for the language L. So you have also, you allow induction axiom to uh, specify formulas that uh, use symbols from L. Then the following are equivalent for, for if, you, if you have two sentences, theta and phi. Uh, number one and two are model theoretic. Every model of T plus theta end extends to a model of T plus phi. Number two is just a weakening of one to, count, to countable models. So it's the same as one, except we just put this countability. Number three is syntactic. We say phi is pi one parenthesis L conservative over T plus theta. And what that means is that if you have a pi one sentence pi that can be proved from T plus phi, then already T plus theta can prove it. So, so here pi is referring to not a proof, but a typical pi one sentence in this extended language. Um, so in the original formulation, by the way, of, uh, of Guaspari, he only has a, he, he doesn't have a theta, he only has a phi. But to be able to adapt it to the wooden setup, it's actually useful to have this theta uh, format. Um, I will not right now go through the proof. I would like to go back to some of these proofs, um, depending on how much we have time by the time uh, my 90 minutes is up. So I'm going to skip this and uh, go to uh, refine Friedman's embedding theorem, yet another ingredient in the, in the proof that we'll need um, in the uh, proof of theorem A plus. So this one um, is a refinement uh, due to independently to Rosaire, um, French logician and uh, Paris, uh, Jeff Paris and uh, Kostas Dimitrokopoulos. Um, so Jeff Paris from England and uh, Kostas Dimitrokopoulos from, from Greece. So uh, the, the theorem is uh, basically gives um, a necessary and sufficient condition for when you can have an embedding of a model M into a model N, both models of I sigma one and countable which takes a particular element of M to a particular element of N. So number one is the model theoretic condition. M is embeddable as an initial segment of N via an embedding J such that J of C is equal to D. So just imagine M and N are two different models and then J is uh, an embedding of M. It isomorph isomorphically copies M as an initial segment of N and also sends C to D. And then the conditions that are um, very uh, 
minimal, but are sufficient to, to prove the theorem, is that again, here the standard system reappearing. The standard system of M is equal to the standard system of N. Um, and uh, um, moreover, the sigma one theory of this model, M with an extra, extra constant C, uh, is a subset of the sigma one theory of N with the extra constant D. It's pretty easy to see that if you have such an embedding, independent of whether M and N are countable, if you have such an embedding, it's you know, using basic definitions of what a standard system is and what's the theory of the sigma one theory, uh, one can get one implies two. The hard part or the non-trivial part is two implies one. Uh, Friedman proved this theorem for, for PA and he didn't have a condition C and D, it was just and the embeddability of models of PA to each other. And uh, basically the improvement due to Rosser and uh, Paris and Dimitrokopoulos is to reduce PA to, to I sigma one. Um, interestingly, there is a, almost a, let's see, Friedman's theorem is from 1970. So there's at least an early 70s. So at least a 15 year gap between the original Friedman theorem and these improvements. Another theorem that pops up in, uh, shows up in, uh, in, in the proof um, is a theory due to Macaloon. This is also really a remarkable theorem, uh, which is very surprising in some sense. Uh, it says if you take a countable non standard model of a very weak fragment of piano arithmetic, I delta zero, basically you only have induction for delta zero formulas. Uh, um, then you, M has a non standard initial segment that is a model of PA. So you could find um, a shorter model which is still non-standard, which is the model of PA. Of course, you could always find a standard, you could, if, you know, if, you, if I give you a standard, a non-standard model of I delta zero, you could just pick the cut of natural numbers, which of course are a model of PA. The catch here is that uh, M is a non-standard initial segment. Uh, it is known by the way that this countability can be removed. I think that's due to uh, Paolo D'Aquino from Italy, uh, who, who proved uh, in a paper, I think from the 1990s, that this countability can be, uh, can be deleted. So the theorem of Macaloon actually holds with a different proof uh, for all non-standard models of I delta zero. Okay, um, I think this is our last um, ingredient when it comes to uh, um, the machinery that is needed. Basically, I, I haven't even given you the beginning of the proof of Wooden's theorem. I'm just putting. I'm just specifying the machinery. Um, in the paper with Blanc, um, we extended Guasparri's theorem to I sigma one. Let me just go back. Um, you see, Guasparri's theorem, as you see, is about models of PA, and it, it it connects index end extendability to pi one conservativity. So, uh, in in this refined version, we look at uh, models of uh, I sigma one. And, uh, and what you see here is, it's very close uh, to actually one, two, and three are exactly the same as uh, in Guasperi's theorem. And then four is, uh, there was no such version of four in Guasperi's theorem. Let me just read it for you here. Um, <clears throat> this is saying um, a particular condition holds, which involves this con, but with two, with the parameter n here. That's defined at the beginning of the page here. So let's look at the beginning of the page. Uh, con of an x, where x is some sort of sentences, is the arithmetical sentence asserting that there is no x proof of a contradiction, pi, pi is the proof of a contradiction, such that the code of pi is less than or equal to n. So when we put an n here, it basically says, as far as the, the, all the proofs of code 0, 1, 2, 3, up to n, we haven't found a proof of contradiction from, from assuming x. So x is some definable set of axioms. So it's a weaker form, a much weaker form of consistency, which says basically up to a particular point, no, no inconsistency has arisen. Um, here, there seems to be a storm developing and my window is open, let me just close it. Um, so now let's look at the, uh, the fourth statement here. Um, 
for every natural number n, t plus theta of c proves this weaker form of consistency of a particular theory. What is this theory? Well, this t was specified at the beginning. That's the theory. Phi was just in Gaspari's theorem was given also at the beginning. And then we have this gamma, which is a shorthand for the set of true sigma one sentences in the language having an extra constant C. So this constant C is gonna be interpreted by these typical S's that I put here. I, I put S's or T's F or M, and uh, this C is some, uh, some constant symbol, some formal symbol, but it's interpreted in a given model by whatever is specified uh, in this coordinate of, of the model. So these models we're gonna be looking at are expansions of, uh, of models of arithmetic by a specified object in the universe. They basically just have uh, one extra constant symbol in addition to the usual symbols of, uh, of piano arithmetic. Okay. Um, this is a, a picture for the proof uh, and also the actual proof that again, we'll come back to some of these proofs later. Um, this hierarchical version of Guasparri's theorem, um, you don't really need to walk through it, but I just wanted to say that there is a hierarchical version that um, is very useful in, in, in proving um, um, some extensions of Wooden's theorem to the hierarchical version. So I will just uh, pass this also. Um, and now we come to, let's see. Um, yes, good. So um, one hour has passed more or less, and now we're about to begin um, talking about Wooden's uh, construction. Um, I'm going to go through this page slowly. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a full page and uh, as you see, the font is also small, but I want everything to be on one page because it's, it's easier to be able to kind of have a bird's eye point of view and then we can zoom in and, and look at uh, various maybe nuances. Uh, this part is, is very straightforward despite maybe uh, what it appears. Uh, it's actually the fact that this construction does the job which is what, what, what needs all the machinery that we needed. This part is understandable by just anybody who just knows the basics of computability theory. Okay, um, so let's see. Um, our construction below of the index E is a minor adaptation of Wooden's original construction. It is understood to be carried out within I sigma one. By choosing appropriate girdle numbering, we may assume that every number K is the code of a Turing machine program. So this way, every time I just have a number, I can just assume that it's a code of a Turing machine as opposed to worrying about those that are and those that are not. Also, we assume that proofs, and of course I mean formal proofs, have been coded so that the length of the proof, as well as the code of each of the formula occurring in the proof is bounded by the code of the proof. Meaning if, you have, if you've coded things in a reasonable way, so if you have a code of the proof, and then the proof mentions maybe some, uses some formulas, the formulas that appear in the proof have, their code is smaller than the code of the proof. So that's uh, most coding systems, uh, unless you're trying to not to do this, have this property. Okay, now given a specified natural number K, we define a set of triples V sub K. So, so these triples, um, First coordinate is a number n. Uh, second coordinate is a p, which is going to be a code of a proof. And this s is going to be, as you see, some, it's going to give us some upper bound on resources. Um, so p is the code of a t proof. Again, remember a t proof is a proof from axioms from t of a theorem of this form. So this k is the same k that we specified. Um, a theorem of this form with the property that the P, which is the proof, is less than or equal to N, this N. So this N is the upper bound um, that th this P should be less than or equal to N. And uh, what about S? Uh, S is some non-empty finite set whose canonical code is at most N. And, uh, and also what about this sigma that appears in this blue formula? Uh, this sigma is a sigma one formula of the form, there's an object X, um, satisfying delta of xv, where delta of xv is delta zero bounded quantifiers. And um, delta of ms holds for some choice of n less than or equal to n. 
So this n is providing us with an upper bound on, uh, on the, uh, on these witnesses x that appear in this uh, sigma one formula. The idea is that um, by making n larger, you're allowing your sigma one search to be looking for more witnesses for, the, for this x object. Um, and of course, we're assuming that uh, the set S is identified with this canonical chord. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not distinguishing here between S and the code for S. So this, this basically is a, is a rather um, clean definition of what these triples are. Uh, B sub K might be empty, but it's clearly it's a recursive set. You can recursively check basically if a triple isn't here or not. Um, and then you define a linear order on B sub K uh, by first fixing a linear order on pairs of natural numbers. And then you stipulate that the triple NPS is less than or equal to another triple N prime, P prime, S prime. If um, either n is less than n prime, or they're the same. And, uh, and in the ordering that we fixed ahead of time, p s is less than or equal to p prime s prime, this in the ordering of, of pairs. So this way, all the predecessors of each element of vk is finite. OK, it is routine to construct, now given this scenario, it is routine to construct a total elementary recursive function f such that for any number k, remember this k was specified at the beginning, j is the code for the program of a write-only Turing machine that has the following features. So, so I'm about, I'm describing basically a Turing machine whose code we're calling j. And, and the function that takes k to j, we're calling f. And then at some point at the end of the page, we're gonna use fixed point theorem to look at the fixed point of this, but that's late coming later. The idea is that we're right now describing a very concrete uh, total recursive function. Um, so how to go from k to j. So the idea is that I'm going to describe what j is by just simply describing what the Turing machine is supposed to do. Um, T sub the Turing machine with this program, J, attempts to calculate a partial recursive function, G of I, triple, as follows. Um, the first triple that it produces is the, is the first element in the sense of this ordering that was defined earlier of V sub K. Of course, if there is such. And assuming that a particular triple has been calculated, then the next triple that we're gonna be calculating is the first element of V sub K, again, V sub K hasn't changed, such that there's a sh smaller proof, P sub I plus one <clears throat> um, sitting in this slot and a superset S sub I of, uh, of that we had earlier. Um, so it looks like um, I, um, there's a little typo here that I'm just only noticing right now. Uh, these are PSN here. Um, and, um, and I have, kind of, there is some garbling here. Uh, so this should be the same. This should be the same pattern, N P S, N prime, P prime, S prime. So this should be also the same pattern as those. This should be the same pattern as those. So there's no nuance here. This is just my sloppiness where I, uh, I should have kept the N P S pattern. Uh, there's, but the idea is that you, you keep looking back to the same VK to be able to do the same calculate to the next calculation. Now the output at any stage of the computation is the most recent SI calculated, if any. Again, you may very well have no output. The idea is that if, it, if you have your first output, you have basically, um, suppose you have some output N0, P0, S0, or you could call it, uh, yeah, this is, this is a good pattern, uh, which is the same pattern as that one. Um, then um, this gives a, puts a premium on on, on how, how big is the next proof you're looking for? Because uh, the next proof you're gonna be looking for is going to be smaller than the proof you just found. And also it, st it stipulates that uh, the S that you're gonna be using for the next stage should be a superset of, of the one that you had earlier. Okay, so um, one more time, uh, the output of this Turing machine at any stage uh, is the most recent S sub I calculated, if any. Therefore, at any given stage of the computation, 
the output tape of TSM, uh, this Turing machine is either blank or the output tape contains the code for some non-empty finite set of numbers. Uh, it is easy to see that for every choice of k, the same k would be fixed at the beginning, uh, w sub j is finite. Um, now let's see why is that. Um, remember that j is just defined to be uh, f of k. Um, let's see, if g of zero is undefined, then w sub j of course is empty. So we have nothing to check because empty set is finite set. If g of zero is defined, then uh, this function sending i to p sub i is a partial recursive function whose domain is bounded above by p0. And, uh, the, and all the next p's are going to be getting smaller. As, j, as, j, as, you're, as you go further and further, your proofs are getting smaller and smaller. So you must at some point halt and not, not produce new output because uh, you cannot descend in, in, indefinitely in the natural numbers. Um, so there is some R such that P sub R is defined, but P sub R plus one is undefined, which implies that uh, your W sub J is just S sub R. All the next computations do not change your output basically. So, so the, the construction of this program is okay. It, it, you know, it takes a, a page to describe it. You know, it takes some familiarity with um, just basic ideas of um, recognizing that by just looking at a description that something is recursive, therefore we can write a Turing machine program for it. And the, I would say the, uh, the, the ingenuity of course is the actual, as usual, just like the applications of, uh, of um, the diagonal lemma is, 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 is coming up with something that actually does the job. But when it comes to the job, remember there are three conditions and one of the conditions was in, uh, finiteness of this W sub E in any universe arithmetic that you're looking at. And the finiteness, what I'm pointing out here is, is basically straightforward, is the other two properties that make a good amount of work to check. The, 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 the three properties that we had in Wooden's theorem and also the extension of Wooden's theorem. The first property is pretty much automatic. But uh, the, the actual Wooden's index therefore is just uh, gotten by, <clears throat> um, by uh, appealing to Kleene's recursion theorem or the formalized second recursion theorem um, in, in I sigma one. Um, I just, because I said, I, I will not go through the actual proofs. I'm, I'm, I'm at this point, um, basically giving you the structure of, 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 of the proof and uh, the ingredients involved. Uh, um, the, going back to theorem, <clears throat> pardon me, A plus. Uh, A plus was the refined version of, um, um, Wooden's theorem proved by Rasmus Blank and I in our paper. Um, it follows by coupling a particular direction of the refined version of Gaspari's theorem um, with the theorem B that I have here. So this theorem B is, uh, is new. I haven't, this is basically, a, in a way, all, all the hard work now goes into this theorem, it turns out. Once you have the other machinery, uh, this is the theorem to prove and then to hook up, I guess by the hard work, I mean, once you hook up this theorem with the, the refined Gaspari, then uh, we get theorem A plus. And this theorem B is, um, as you see, kind of looks like Wooden's theorem in the sense that um, it says uh, pick, um, or even looks like theorem A plus because it says pick an RA extension of I sigma one. There's an index uh, satisfying three conditions. Uh, conditions A and B are the same as um, theorem A plus and also in, as Wooden's theorem. It's condition C that is uh, very technical. And uh, this condition C basically says uh, for every natural number N, a particular theory proves a particular consistency statement. Uh, this particular theory is obtained by uh, strengthening T with uh, one statement which says W sub E is a subset of C. Um, and this statement here you're seeing here is the consistency up to the natural number n that was specified ahead of time of this theory. Uh, uh, T plus W sub E is equal to C as opposed to a subset of C plus gamma, where gamma is this uh, true sigma one sentences uh, with an extra constant C. Um, so, um, having seen the overall 
structure of the ingredients, uh, as I mentioned before, I will uh, not look at the proofs until we see how much time we have and how much, you know, which of the proofs we want to look at. Um, the applications that I want to show you now, um, one application um, is to defining the set of natural numbers in, um, in models of fragments of, of PA. Um, let me just um, first motivate this theorem. Uh, if, you, if I give you a non-standard model of PA, uh, a non-standard model of PA, and if I look at the set of natural numbers, meaning the standard natural numbers, which is an initial segment of um, the non-standard model, then the non-standard sort of, the set of standard elements of this model, also known as the standard cut, has no hope of being definable in the model because uh, if this, if, if, if this, uh, subset was definable, it would violate uh, induction holding in the model because it has the first element and uh, well, see, basically some, some formula that claims to define it would, would zero would be in it. And is, if something is in it, the successor is also in it. Um, so the uh, no proper cut of a model of PA is first order definable. So that's like one of the first things one learns in about non-standard models of arithmetic. But if you weaken PA to a fragment of PA, then you can start asking, can I have a, you know, a situation where the standard natural numbers are definable? And also you could, you could see how much of PA can you arrange and also for this to happen, because PA of course is a, is a big theory. You might want to take a big fragment of it and still have this remarkable feature of the natural numbers being definable. And also you could get picky about how, what is the formula that is defining uh, uh, set of natural numbers. So McAloon in 1978 um, proved um, this remarkable theorem that um, if you if you fix this, your favorite natural number, uh, then there's a model M of PA, uh, which on one hand is a pretty decent amount of PA because it satisfies all the pi n plus two consequences of PA. This actually just to be very concrete, suppose n was equal to zero. So your model M would satisfy all the pi two consequences of PA, which means all the functions that are total, pr provably total in PA are going to be total in M because to be total means for all X, there's a Y, something happens. So, uh, so this model of arithmetic, even though it's not a model of full PA, when it comes to provably total functions is exactly agrees with PA. And on the other hand, the standard cut is definable both by a sigma n plus one and also a pi n plus one uh, formula in, n, uh, in M. The idea is, and that's why this is the shorthand for it, being both sigma, one, sigma n plus one definable and uh, pi n plus one definable. Um, the, the idea of the proof actually is uh, for, I'm, I'm just giving you a pictorial proof of this on the next slide for n equals to um, zero. To be, but the same proof ends up working for the, with the parameterized version of theorem A plus. Um, by the way, the parameterized version um, is, um, it's worked out, it's, it's pretty much the same proof, but it's worked out in Rasmus Blank's uh, PhD dissertation in 2017. Um, so this is, uh, this is the pictorial proof. Um, because this proof has a lot of ingredients, let me walk through this proof very slowly again. Um, I want to build a model of, uh, of the pi two consequences of PA. So this symbol means all the pi two theorems of PA. So you, I want to find a model M which satisfies this property. Um, and the way I, I, I uh, and at the same time, I want this model to um, have the property that the uh, set of natural numbers are uh, delta one definable. So if n is equal to zero, then a set of natural numbers would be uh, delta one definable, n equals to zero. So what you do is that you first fix, you, first of all, you pick a model M zero of PA in which W sub E is empty. Now W sub E is Wooden's W sub E. And remember, uh, W sub E is empty in a model if and only if um, PA is consistent is true in the model. So you begin with the model of PA in which 
PA is consistent. So we can arrange for W sub E of M sub zero to be empty uh, by just taking a model of arithmetic in which consistency of PA is true. That's our M zero. Now in M zero, this is M zero basically, it's gonna be end extended later, but right now just look at M zero and it's a non-standard model, fix a, a sequence co finally going downwards toward the standard cut. That's gonna be B0, B1, B2, et cetera. So we have a sequence of Bs of length omega, which are downward co-final in the non-standard part of M0. Also, um, pick, you can pick um, just the set of natural numbers, or you can pick some other sequence uh, of natural numbers that are infinite going towards this cut again, A0, A1. Now, I can, by, by Wooden's theorem, I can find a model M1 of PA, which end extends M0, where W sub E has, remember, I can specify any finite set in the sense of the model that is a superset of the W sub E of the model. And in an end extension, I can arrange for that set that I specified to be exactly a W sub E. So what I, what I will, specify in my first step is I would basically say, I want in, the, in M1, W sub E to have the order pair zero comma A zero and one comma B zero. So that's gonna be the, the output of, uh, of W sub E in M1. Now remember M1 is an end extension, so uh, it doesn't mess anything in this part of the model. It just basically adds things on the top. Now for M2, I would become more ambitious. I say now, now, not only I want W sub E in M2 to be what it was before, zero A zero is here, one B zero is, is here, but I also want two A one and three B one. The idea is that I'm going to use ordered pairs whose first coordinate is even to, to basically indicate that I'm, that I'm getting an A here. And um, I'm going to use odd numbers one and three for these guys. So as you go further and further up, at any stage, you have um, a finite set of ordered pairs. Um, and these ordered pairs, basically, their first coordinate is either zero or one. If the first pair is, uh, first coordinate is zero, is, is basically, second coordinate is one of these A's. And uh, if a second, if, if a first uh, coordinate is one, the second coordinate is one of these B's. Finitely many, of course. Now, uh, we do this omega many times. So by the time we get to M omega, um, remember this is not an elementary chain. So we cannot expect this to be a model of PA, but uh, it's an elementary fact of model theory that uh, in, a, in a chain, the pi two consequences of the theory is preserved. So the pi two consequences of PA are preserved in this end extension chain. And then you could check that is in this, in this model M sub omega, um, using this W sub E, uh, both the set of um, the standard cut and its complement is sigma one definable. And the sigma one definability is basically by just, we're gonna, we just look at this W sub E and just given the even and odd um, distinction can, can define uh, the, the non-standard elements in a sigma one way and the standard elements in a sigma one way. Um, there are other applications uh, that uh, Rasmus Blanc, for example, has one in his thesis, which is very nice. Um, I want to point this application because it also connects with, the, with an open question that, that comes uh, at the end of my slides, which is, uh, we're about to reach it. Um, so for, for every N, um, so in blue, I've written a sigma N set that can simulate, it can mimic uh, any other sigma N set. Um, um, so for every n greater than or equal to two, there is a sigma n formula sigma of x, such that if you pick any model of PA and any other sigma n formula in an end extension, um, their extension is the same. The, the same elements satisfy basically one if and only if they satisfy the other one. So there's basically one sigma n formula which in an end extension can become any other sigma n formula that you specify. Um, so that's uh, in, 
in Rasmus Planck's thesis. Uh, um, in, a, in a more recent paper uh, by uh, Belanger, Chong, Wang, Wang, and Yang, uh, and it's my pleasure that at least two of these authors are actually uh, here with us. Uh, there might be others. Uh, um, um, there is um, a result that shows that, uh, in a way, it hooks up with the study of singular-like models of, of arithmetic, uh, that any specified countable set can be, uh, can be uh, definable in, in, in such a model of PA. Um, and um, the last application on this page is um, Joel Hankins uh, uh, has a long paper um, called Modal Logic of Arithmetic Potentialism. Um, so as far as I know, this paper and also the previous paper, they're, they're I guess, under review, uh, but they're available on the archive. Um, and in that paper, Hankins studies the modal logic uh, in which the modal logic where the Kripke models you're looking at, the accessibility relation is n the extension and the nodes are models of PA. So a given world is a model of PA and a world is accessible to another world if it's an n the extension of it. Um, and he's able to calculate uh, uh, the, the modal logic basically of, of this Kripke structure um, that I just specified. Depending on whether you have, param you allow parameters or not, you get a uh, model logic between S4 and S5. It's a very interesting application to, uh, to model logic and understanding, uh, um, in a way, the logic of potentialism. Potentialism, the idea is that um, the, each world is a potential universe, and by going from one universe to the other one, you're, uh, in a way, this is like Aristotle's idea of infinity. You, it's, you, you keep enlarging your model, and there's always another enlargement. That you could do. Um, okay. Um, I, I said something about I want to compare Wooden's theorem with Kripke's. Um, and uh, this, this slide is exactly to do that. Um, so if you look at actually Kripke's theorem, you, get, you can get almost something like Wooden's theorem, except that um, condition one. Uh, instead of saying W is finite, basically, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, never mind. Um, condition one or two are the same. Uh, they're just swapped here. Um, in, the er in the earlier versions, um, this condition was first, this one was second, but the first two conditions are the same. Uh, condition number three actually is what's uh, different. And the difference is very subtle. Um, and the subtlety has to do with the fact that you, you need con T uh, to be holding in the model that you're going to be end extending. And otherwise, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty much like Wooden's theorem. Um, the proof, of course, is easier in some sense um, because um, the, the Kripke's construction of the fixed point is much easier than, than, than Wooden's. So, uh, so what makes this, this formulation, of course, was not Kripke's formulation because he wasn't looking at end extensions. This formulation, uh, because he's talking about models of I sigma one, uh, it needs that refined version of arithmetical completeness theorem for I sigma one uh, to get the job done. And that's actually something quite, quite high powered. As I mentioned, uh, it's, it's a refinement of the arithmetized completeness theorem that was done originally by Hayek. Um, and for countable models, it was done by Harrington. Um, here's another um, um, theorem, which again uses Kripke's idea, uh, Kripke's fixed point, that, that um, for any um, recursively enumerable theory extending Q, um, there's an index um, satisfying the following two properties. Uh, so condition number one, is just like before. Um, and condition number two is now different. It basically, look, look at this condition. Uh, this basically says, um, this W sub E in an end extension can become any W sub K, even if K is non-standard. So basically specified, specify some W sub K, even allow a non-standard K in, in N. 
and uh, and in an end extension, W sub E can become exactly W sub K. Uh, again, we need con T here. So this was missing again in, in Wooden's theorem. And also notice this is, this is missing in Blanc's theorem. In Blanc's theorem, this, this model M is just a model of PA, not a model of PA plus con PA. Uh, and this, oops, allows me to um, pose uh, as, oh yeah, this, this good time is exactly, almost 90 minutes and we're, this is, this is the, the open question. Uh, so this open question is basically whether, let me go back to Blanc's theorem. Basically the question is what happens to n equals to one case of Blanc's theorem? And if you, if you, if you wanna make sure that you know, it becomes interesting uh, and uh, analogous to what we were doing earlier. So the idea is that can we come up with an index E um, such that um, con of T is equivalent to W sub E being empty, but in any model of, of T, and T is some theory extending PA, uh, and any specified index in M where in the model M, W sub E is a subset of W sub K, then M has an end extension to W sub E becoming exactly W sub K. So this is like Wooden's theorem, except that Wooden, in Wooden's theorem and the extension and, and the refinement, this WK sub K was just some finite in the sense of the model RE set. So it was a very special RE set, a finite RE set that was specified at the time. We were asking, can we specify any RE set in the model that contains W sub E and hope that in the end extension, we have this exact matching. Um, I think this question, whether the answer is yes or no, is going to be a, an interesting proof. Uh, um, and uh, and it's, it's basically, it seems to be probably the most pressing open question that, that, uh, that um, Rasmus and I had by the time we finished our work on this subject. So at this point, I will um, just officially end my 90 minute talk with this slide, and then uh, we'll go to the next stage. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Anayat. Uh, uh, Yong, so uh, should we uh, let the audience ask questions first or give enough time for the commentators? Uh, Chang Yong, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, first, if you have a comment, you can get it first and then you can uh, uh, give some time to the interlocutors uh, of a possible question or comment, and then anyway, any, okay. any people are free. Okay, to so ask so questions. okay, so we leave the the the, the question uh, in the end. Okay, okay, so uh, I'm glad to uh, introduce our two uh, uh, commentators or intercalators, uh, Dr. Uh, Lawrence Wang Tianlu and uh, Dr. Zachary McKinsey. Uh, so. Uh, Dr. Wang is now uh, my colleague working in the uh, National University of Singapore, and uh, Dr. McKenzie is in Zhejiang University. Okay, so uh, I don't know who wants to make a comment first. Uh, maybe uh, we follow alphabetical order. Uh, maybe uh, Zachary, can you uh, speak first? And uh, then we move on to. Uh, Sure, sure. I had a, I had a question. Um, could you could you please go to the um, the statement of theorem A plus <clears throat> on the slides? Thank you very much for a great talk. It was, oh, you're quite welcome. It was, um, so um, so you, here you Wait. said that in um, in condition uh, three um, that. Um, that countability could be um, removed uh, if T was an extension of PA, right? Uh, any, yes, yes. Any idea exactly. about the countability condition when T is not an extension of PA? Um, no, we suspect that, for example, let's take the case of T equals to I, uh, I sigma one. Um, it, 
it's a very hard question already, and it's an open question, whether every model of I sigma one has an end, proper end extension to a model of I sigma one. So that's, that's basically um, already an interesting open question, which would shed light on exactly the question you're asking. Uh, because um, if, if it is true that in every model of I sigma one, every model of I sigma one has an end extension to a model of I sigma one, then there's hope for this countability condition um, for I sigma one even to be removed. But first one would have to settle that question. So every model of I sigma one, regardless of cardinality. Yes. Exactly, yes, yes. And, and it's a question that off and on I've talked to, to Lawrence about and, uh, and we've always felt like we've gotten close to the answer, but it always keeps slipping away. So I think it's, it's, if, if, I, if I had to recommend one hard question for any ambitious um, researcher about topics connected to this talk, I would say that's, that's also a, a very nice question to tackle. Um, is there a model of I sigma one which has no end extension to a model of I sigma one? Or is the opposite true? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. So, Zach, do you have further questions, comments, or uh... Uh, not? Not at the moment. That's, no. uh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Zach. Okay. Quite welcome. Yeah. So now, um, maybe Lawrence, uh, can you? Uh... Yes. Uh, thank okay. you. Uh, thank you, Ali, for the talk. Uh, while welcome. we are on. While we're on this slide, can I ask whether it is likely that we can weaken I sigma one to weaker theories? Yes, that's a, that's also that's also an interesting question because um, the the proof that works for I sigma one um, there's one stage of the proof that it breaks down meaning meaning. Using the strategy for I sigma one, one sees where the where the proof breaks down for, for for weaker theory. So maybe it's not a bad idea to look at that stage because uh, it's um, it's basically in the proof of the refined Gaspari theorem. And um, so in the proof of Gra uh, refined Gaspari theorem, uh, it turns out we want to find an an end extension of M. And the way we find that end extension of M is rather tricky. We don't just use arithmetized completeness. Um, if M was a model of PA, we would do that. But, but, but we end up going to a cut uh, M0 uh, using Michaelou's theorem uh, on which we have PA. And then we using, um, using overspill, we get a non-standard R. This R is non-standard such that this condition is true. And the way we get this, um, this, this condition, of course, uh, is, a, uh, is a pi one condition. Um, and um, that is everything um, bounded by R actually, or? Um, yes, everything is bounded by R. Oh, hang on a second. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, because R is actually bounded, this is definitely delta zero now. And now let's look at this set. Um, but I think this, this is okay because this is, uh, okay, so this R, uh, okay, so it looks like, okay, I take it back. Good, okay. <laughs> um, um, so this R in a model of I delta zero would be available. Um, and then the other step of the proof was the refined version of uh, self-embedding theorem. So this model now is a model of I delta zero plus X plus let's say B sigma one. We're trying to reduce I sigma one to I delta zero plus X plus B sigma one. And this model, the way this proof works is that we um, use arithmetized completeness in M zero using, using this condition uh, to, to uh, end extend um, M zero to this model N this model N would be recursively saturated uh, and it would have this property where the sigma one theory of this model would be contained. So, uh, 
So actually, yes, I'm sorry, I, I, I misspoke. Uh, I think this theorem, I think there was something else. I remember in the back of my mind, there was something which wasn't working, but this, this actually, because of the recursive saturation of N, we should, we should be able to basically still carry out the embedding theorem um, and embed M as an initial segment of that. So, um, so I, would, I would like to correct myself and say, for I delta zero plus X plus B sigma one, the, I think the proof goes through. Uh, now that I just said that, I wonder if I, uh, pardon me one second. Uh, Oh yes, this is actually even a remark in my paper with Rasmus. Uh, it's remark 2.61. What, what I just told you is just remark 2.61. So, uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, I, uh, it's written here uh, in the paper. Uh, if the recursive saturation of the ethnic section is removed, uh, I'm also. Uh, I'm also referring to our paper, the paper that you and I wrote, uh, Lawrence, uh, because uh, of what happens. Uh, if we use a uh, tableau consistency in, uh, in other settings. Uh, so so uh, in light of the fact that I just came up with this answer rather uh, I first said no, and then I said yes. Uh, allow me to, uh, to 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 think about this to make sure that I'm not missing anything obvious, uh, because okay. for some reason initially my, my worry was exactly uh, was this overspill, but overspill because of this limited nature of the consistency statements are going to be fine. Uh, so, uh, think, which is also confirmed. Here. Yeah, go ahead. I think there may be some use of I sigma one somewhere when you're when your PI goes to PI plus one and then PI plus two and they have to reach the- Okay, I think you put your finger on it. Yes, 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 yes. So this Guaspari theorem goes through, well, this extended Guaspari theorem goes through, but you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah. Um, in the proof that W sub E is finite, uh, I sigma one is used, yes. And, and I think then, so, so, it's, so the problem is not here, the problem is actually in, in another part of the proof about finiteness of W sub E. So as far as I know, no work has been done on this topic except for the papers I referred uh, earlier about the status of this construction, of, of the W sub E construction as opposed to the extended Gospari. So, so that would be an, definitely an interesting area to explore. It's interesting because uh, so we have now the question for I sigma one for arbitrary models, and now we have the question for these weaker theories, mm -hmm. which are which are open. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which way do you think it would go for B sigma one plus say super exp? Um, you know the the uh, the the use of I sigma one in in that infinite descent you know, that prevents, you know, basically you want to prevent an infinite descent. Um, and it seemed like I sigma one was, cannot be, cannot be lowered, but I haven't looked at that argument for a while, but I remember um, it was actually a paper by Albert Fisser and Lev Beklemyshev where they were analyzing, you know, these constructions of these, um, uh, Wooden's construction is a special case of certain constructions of, um, of recursively enumerable sets using this idea of, uh, of, of, of getting smaller and smaller witnesses. And they analyze these proofs and uh, in, in their paper, they, as I recall, they, uh, they made a point about I, I sigma one being basically what's needed. And they certainly, both of them are quite uh, savvy about the powers of I delta zero plus uh, X plus B sigma one. So I suspect that if I had to guess that that there is a counter example somewhere. Okay. And I have no idea how hard or easy would be, it would be. Meaning you, this, Meaning, this descent yes. would be necessary for, for the 
proof of this for the construction of this flexible formula. There is no yes. other construction. Yeah, for this for this particular one, yes. Okay. Um, now I'm, I'm glad you're pressing me on this because, as I was also um, getting prepared for this talk, um, it, it seems to me this paper of Macaloon that I referred to earlier, because uh, he uses also flexible predicates, which which seem to be somehow they're not like woodens, but they're also not like exactly Mostovskis. They seem to be using a mix and match. Uh, they seem to be not as powerful as woodens, and yet he's able to do, for example, what, what he does in his paper using his techniques. It would be really interesting to be further analyzing that paper. I have a feeling it's one of those papers which didn't get sufficiently, uh, in a way, explored. I, I, I think one reason is that uh, it, it has a lot of results. You know, It's not just two or three results. It's like maybe 10 results in the paper. And the, and the results are all packed in a tight way and highly technical. And, uh, and, and especially these constructions that he does where he mixes and matches these different completeness theorem with incompleteness phenomena. It would be interesting to, to be better understanding the powers of it vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Kripke construction and the, uh, the wooden construction. So it would be definitely, uh, it's one of the most underappreciated papers I think in the subject, the, the, the Macaloon paper. Yes. And it, and I, I agree, it's not easy to understand, like see what's happening yeah. in that paper. Yeah, because he, very quickly, he, he sets up a very, very, uh, I would say, uh, he, he puts all the theorems in the most general um, context um, you know, with, with all kinds of parameters floating around. And it's, it, and, uh, it's kind of reminds me of, um, of a style of writing papers, which, uh, is like the style of uh, Walter Rudin's analysis book, you know, where once if you sit, if you're willing to sit down and spend three hours on, on one page, it's then perfectly fine. But otherwise, <laughs> uh, read something else. <laughs> yeah. uh, can I ask one more question? Oh, of course, oh, of course. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so, in our application, it would be good to know. If you have this flexible formula for a theory and then a flexible formula for a stronger theory, is there any provable implication between the two? And from um, this, if, if this flexible predicate can be formulated as some kind of inconsistency predicate, then probably, yes. yes. So it's good to know whether there is any information on this line. The only information I can give on that is because the emptiness of this W sub E for Wooden is equivalent to the consistency of the theory. Um, so if we have, let's say, PA versus PA plus con PA, then the W sub E for PA is provably empty in PA plus con PA. Um, so, by, so by, if you, if you, if you, increase your theory by some con statement, then you're in a way trivializing the, the flexible formula of the weaker theory. Um, okay. so, so that's kind of why I think, uh, unless the, the extension is not as powerful as just adding a con statement. Okay, so there is- Because I don't know in your setting. So I cannot- Sorry, so I cannot say if an element is in this flexible sigma one predicate, then there is something say below this element that is an inconsistency proof of some kind for the theory involved. It'd be good if there is such a characterization. Oh, I see, so you want somehow, um, you're right, right, right. So, so basically you want to refine being empty or non-empty by saying, um, right, yes. Um, I suspect there is probably such a, I mean, looking at the proof, I think there is probably such a, a characterization using these refined notions of consistency. Okay, it's, it's yeah. good. That's, that's, that's my hunch. That, that would be actually very nice. Mm -hmm. it, it, it would bring a lot of clarity also to the structure of these W sub E's. Yes. 
Yes, and yeah. it would be it'd be very helpful for our applications in building different models as well. So it's, it'd be good to see it worked out. Very good. <laughs> so very these good. are all my questions. Thank you, Ali. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lawrence. Uh, so uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, So I have a naive question if, if nobody have uh, other course, questions. Yeah. So the, what is Woodin's uh, motivation to, to uh, consider this? Uh, what, what is the comment about this? Uh, um, yeah, so what, what, why, why he considered this? Uh, the time and, uh, and uh, subtlety. And so what, what exactly is the background? Um, so the idea is that um, I think the way I understand his, uh, mm. his point is that going back to the fact that based on just uh, elementary combinatorics, uh, there are finite binary strings of arbitrary high Kolmogorov complexity. Um, so, um, so that would be, in, of course, in the standard model or in a, in a given model, right? Um, and, uh, but, we, but his idea is that, so what, in a way the interesting and maybe the problematic mm -hmm. and the intriguing part of his, of, of his uh, motivation is that he's equating extending time by extending a model. So this idea of, of, mm -hmm. a, of a recursively, of, of basically a deterministic system being given enough time, in a way is I would say the crux of his, um, of his of, of what he's pointing to see, because mm -hmm. of course, if if in our in, in our intuition, you know, we have the standard model and, and all the computations are there, but if we basically uh, allow ourselves the another picture that basically uh, the standard model is after all some sort of Platonic ideal, but maybe we're in some time is mm -hmm. some model of arithmetic, and that ex so if we just allow more time for, for a deterministic process, it could calculate a very highly mm -hmm. complex from the point of view of Kolmogorov mm -hmm. binary sequence in an, in, a, in an extension of the universe. So um, maybe if I were to, uh, let's see, uh, kind of go back to, uh, yeah. So this coding arbitrary information, what he means is so you have this W sub E in a given universe, which is a finite mm -hmm. set. Um, and now, now think of this maybe as not just a finite set, but a finite binary sequence. Mm -hmm. um, and now you bring me a very complex binary sequence, far more complex than this input of this Turing machine. Um, and, and the same Turing machine with more time would be able to compute something mm -hmm. which it shouldn't be able to compute in this universe. But in the next universe, it's, it's able to actually compute that. So it's it's uh, this particular volume, by the way, is a volume mm. which has um, uh, a collection of papers. The only logicians, I think, which, as I recall, I could be wrong because it's been some years since I looked at this volume. Uh, Harvey Friedman and he wouldn't, and maybe maybe one other logician is there. But then there are some physicists, some philosophers, and some theologians uh, who uh -huh. have written. You know, so it's all about, I would say, very metaphysical and philosophical uh -huh. uh, Interesting. Yeah. connections with, 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 with science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Yeah. yeah, sure, you're welcome. Um, yeah. so, uh, so any other questions? Uh, thank you, Ali, for the uh, very nice uh, lecture. And uh, I uh, very enjoyed. Uh, yeah, uh, when you t when you when you compare a uh, Kripuk zero with uh, Woodin zero, and uh, maybe I missed some point. So do you mean that uh, Woodin zero is stronger than Kripuk uh, zero? Actually, that's I'm glad you asked that question because in some sense it's both stronger and weaker. <laughs> um, it's Kripke's theorem. Um, actually, let's look at the the last slide here. Meaning, if, if we look at 
the model theoretic version of Kripke's theorem. Um, and, and I'm thinking of this, of this top one. Um, it, uh, this, if we look at this condition here with, with Wooden's theorem, in Wooden's theorem, the way it was actually refined by Rasmus Blanc and I, uh, so Wooden theorem, as you remember, it was just about models of PA that are countable. And then um, for I sigma one, we have Wooden's theorem for countable models of I sigma one without count of T. So this is, this is where Wooden's theorem is now stronger, meaning the re refined Wooden's theorem would be stronger. Um, but um, the other I interesting part is that it's also stronger here because we have removed the countability condition. So in a way, Wooden's theorem, so to, a short answer to, to your question is that they're incomparable. Um, in some sense, Wooden's theorem is stronger if you think of the, of the limitation on cardinality of the models. Um, if you're working with models of I sigma one, um, um, you, uh, you, get, you get this arrangement basically for all, for all models of I sigma one, as opposed to uh, just the countable ones. Uh, and yet you have to also assume con T. So that's what makes it uh, weaker. Now, having said that, I, I would say I would say just the construction itself of Kripke's is a lot easier and more straightforward. Um, so, in, in in that sense, it's a weaker theorem. Sorry, there is actually big thunderstorms happening. Can you hear it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. it's mm. yes. There's some drama by Mother Nature. Yeah. Yes. Anyway, um, so but but but. but the, um, the other, other comment I wanted to make in connection with Kripke's theorem is that this theorem of Blanc actually that uh, I put earlier that appears in his thesis, it actually um, uses a mix of Kripke and Wooden uh, techniques to be able to, um, to arrange this, uh, this construction. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of a nice, uh, nice blend of them. I have a feeling that this subject is still to be further investigated because uh, the, um, um, the, um, the whole topic of this flexibility, um, it seems like uh, it, 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 it was opened up by, in some sense, by Mostovsky. It was expanded by, um, by Kripke. And then, and then Woodin wrote his paper. And then Rasmus and I wrote our paper. Um, and then the other papers are basically applications uh, of, of these techniques. They're not refining these uh, flexibility results. But I think, um, for example, um, the, the question that Lawrence asked about um, connecting the appearance of a particular element in a W sub E corresponding to some, some consistency statement would be a, a nice way to, to characterize uh, basically what's happening for these flexible formulas. And again, um, I want to repeat this, this open question because this open question is, in a way, when I, when I first saw Wooden's theorem, um, I, I asked myself, why didn't, he, why didn't he prove this? Because why did he limit to finite sets? You know, why didn't he prove, a, <laughs> why didn't he come up with an RE set which can basically become any other RE set? Um, and um, having talked with um, people who are knowledgeable in these constructions, this, this seems to be a very hard question, at least, uh, I know some people who are experts uh, with these kind of constructions, and they, uh, they they report that they have tried to settle this question, but they haven't. So that's the, that's why I think it's a good question for ambitious researchers. <laughs> yeah, I have another question. Just uh, this theorem say that uh, uh, T can prove that consistent equivalent to uh, W equal uh, empty. So do you mean yes. that? Uh, do you mean that uh, we cannot show that uh, uh, T uh, cannot prove uh, W E equal empty? Uh, if so, and then we get that T cannot prove consistent with T, and so uh, from Wooden theorem, we get a second inconsistent theorem. Um, right. So let's see. Um, I, I guess yes. So you, you were saying. 
were you referring to this question or or uh yeah just uh, uh -huh. the condition one say that uh, consisting uh, in t consists of t is equivalent to w e equal empty yeah my question yes. my question is that uh, can we show that uh, t cannot prove that uh, W E equal empty. If so, and then we get that uh, uh, T cannot prove consistent, and so we get a second in complete zero. So wooden zero is stronger than uh, Goddard's in complete zero. For for me, uh, my feeling is. Feeling oh yes, 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 yes. Oh yes, 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 yes. If it, it's definitely true that that um, that uh, Kripke's uh, sorry, Wooden's theorem is stronger. It's stronger than Goddard's. Yes, exactly. In a way, um, in a way. The size of W sub E gives some sort of numerical measure of how inconsistent T is, basically. Because mm. so, so as, as, you, as you said, by Gödel's second incompleteness theorem, Kant is not provable. Um, and therefore, W sub E equals to empty is not provable. But, um, but from the Gödel point of view, therefore, either W sub E is empty or not empty. But in Wooden's formulation, W sub E, of course, can become different finite sets. So in a way, it gives some sort of numerical measure to inconsistency. The cardinality of W sub E gives some numerical information about um, inconsistency. In that, in that form, it's a refinement uh, of Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, from, from, from Wooden's theory, we, we can get it that uh, T cannot prove W equal empty because Wooden yes. zero is a, a extension of PA. We know that uh, uh, second uh, uh, applies for any uh, R extension of PA. But uh, for your uh, theorem, is extension about the I, I, I sigma one. So uh, the question is that, uh, uh, for example, can we show that uh, I sigma one cannot prove the consistent? Uh, I, I just mean whether D2 hold for. Oh, I, I see. Think, yeah. Um, Actually, uh, yeah, maybe this I sigma, to make this actually more uniform, I should have, uh, we can just put even T here to make it a little nicer. Um, meaning, uh, I think this I sigma one is kind of ruining some symmetry here. So, um, and we can even take T, T to be PA. Actually, let's take to be PA um, and then just put PA here. So PA can prove that kind of PA if and only if W sub E is empty. And then this part of course is again, T being uh, PA. It just, it turns out uh, in, in Wooden's theorem, um, the, the proof that the consistency of T is equivalent to WE being empty didn't need the full power of PA. It, it just, it, it could already be done in, in I sigma one because basically you're looking for some inconsistency. Uh, that you're looking for certain triples in, in Wooden's proof and, and uh, and, and if, you, if you find certain proofs, definitely, for example, in the standard model of arithmetic, definitely W sub E would be empty. So, uh, so to make this question a little nicer, I think what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to send you uh, uh, a, my slides and I will, to, just in case somebody looks at this question, I would replace the T here with PA and also this part with PA and this part with PA and this part with PA. So we have a very nice, clean question only about PA. And, and uh, flexible formulas, well, flexible RE sets in PA. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I guess it's about time. It's already two hours, right? Uh, oh, yes, so, yes, time flies. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay, so let's uh, thank uh, uh, Ali, Professor Anayat again. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. It, it, okay. it, it, was a, it was a pleasure to be uh, yeah. seeing you, uh, my, my colleagues, after all this long period of not having seen many of you, and uh, I, I wish you a, a very pleasant and a productive summer. Yeah. I hope to see you soon. <laughs>